I'm going to bump this with a personal story for all of you. I had just graduated, and like most college students, I had no money or job. Me and a few of my friends decided to go in on a shitty apartment together, just until we get on our feet. Find this great three-bedroom for cheap, but the landlord was extremely suspicious. No contract was ever signed, just required money up front every month. The apartment itself was nice, but very old, like something out of the 1920s, except for this one massive part of the hallway closet that looked like it was recently plastered over, just an awkward white spot that nobody tried to hide or paint over. We asked the landlord about it, and he just said it was from recent renovations. We knew that was complete bullshit, but we were desperate, and the place was cheap. Cut to a month later. We're all settled in and doing fine. One night, we're watching TV when there's a knock at the door. Two massive fucking Russians are standing at our doorstep. I mean like six foot tall, prison muscle jacked guys. One was wearing a sailor hat and tank top, which looked tremendously gay. But at this point, none of us were laughing. They asked about some guys, saying they owed them money. We tell them that we've been living there for a month and that we don't know the men that they're looking for. The Russians get visibly confused but don't push the issue much further. Instead, they get in their car and just sit there watching our apartment for several hours. Now, this apartment was in a super shitty neighborhood. We're talking boarded up houses, drug dens, drive-by shooting kind of shitty. So nobody cared or took notice of some suspicious guys sitting in their cars for hours like us. Eventually, we all got freaked out enough to call the cops. How was the landlord suspicious? And how did you know what they said about the wall's bullshit? The landlord was suspicious because he didn't make us sign a lease or contract or anything. Just wanted the money up front. Also, he said that plastered hole was from renovations. When clearly nothing else in the apartment looked new or renovated. Anyway, of course, once the single cop showed up, the Russians flew off. We explained to him what happened, but he said there wasn't much he could do other than tell officers to keep a lookout for the car. The whole time we were talking, he kept looking around the apartment nervously. And finally, right before he left, he asked us, do you guys live here by choice? We were a little freaked out by the question, but told him we were just college kids looking for someplace cheap. He asked if we knew the story behind this place. And when we answered no, he told us what he knew. Apparently, a bunch of illegal immigrants had been living in this apartment previously, but had all been deported. Somehow, they had gotten wondering that the immigration police were coming mere minutes before they came. One of them had somehow managed to get into the spaces behind the walls and hide there for several hours as the police searched the place. The police made the hole in the closet trying to get to him, but he had escaped and was still at large. Of course, after telling us that horrific story, the cop left and we pretty much just stayed up all night afraid that a bunch of Russians were going to murder us. Next month, we confronted our landlord, saying we knew about the illegals, and he begged us not to move out. We were probably the first tenants in years that had paid rent on time and in full each month. Anyways, none of us had any better options at the time, so we were kind of stuck anyway, so we stayed. Next post is when things started getting batshit crazy. Another couple of weeks passed, and neither of us had seen the Russians again. So we were starting to feel more relaxed again, except for one of my roommate's girlfriend. She didn't live there, but stayed with us several times a week. One morning, she asked if we had heard shuffling and scratching at night. We were all heavy sleepers, so we just wrote it off as typical odd noises in an old place. Only a few nights later, I had fallen asleep on the couch watching TV. When I finally awoke to head to my own bed, I also heard the scratching. It sounded like a fucking rat burrowing in our walls and ceilings. There would be several seconds of furious scratching, and then what sounded like pieces of wood or debris falling or settling. The next day, I told my roommates, and that night we all stayed up together and heard the scratching and skittering once again. We all concluded it was rats and called the landlord to hire an exterminator. The asshole took several weeks to follow through. So for the time being, we just ignored the scratches seeing as they only happened at night, and most of us could sleep through it anyway. That, and none of us had actually seen any rats. Another night, we were all sleeping peacefully, when a loud boom woke us all up suddenly, 
It sounded like someone had fucking dropped an anvil on a ceiling. It was that loud. We all searched the place, but there were no cracks or broken items or any signs of damage whatsoever. So we just ignored it and went back to bed. After the big boom, we went almost two weeks without incident. But during that time, the apartment started smelling terrible. At first, we just thought it was us. I mean, you had three guys living in one place. Of course, it's a little rank, right? We even spent one full day cleaning and washing everything, but the smell kept getting worse. It got to the point where walking into the apartment was like walking into a public restroom where someone had taken a dump and let it sit all day. At this point, we just harassed our landlord with endless phone calls until he came himself. Upon entering our place, he almost puked. Finally, the next day, an exterminator came. The scratches had stopped, but one of my roommates made a video of it with his cell phone to show the guy. He said it sounded like rats, or possibly a possum, but said that usually they don't stink up a place as bad as ours. Now we lived on the top floor of this apartment, and the exterminator wondered if we had access to the attic. We told him no, and that we had never been up there, because the only way to get in was a tiny square door in the ceiling of our hallway that was always locked. The exterminator said he would get access to it from the landlord and return in a few days. Next day, I come home from work early, and to my surprise, I see those two fucking Russians waiting in their car again. I was really starting to get sick of all the crazy shit going on in the apartment, so I got my courage up and went right up to their window and knocked. They rolled the window down, and I asked why they kept watching us. They said they knew I was lying about their friend. I screamed that I didn't know the guy who owed them money, and said if they didn't leave us alone, I would call the cops. In hindsight, I was probably really lucky they didn't shoot me or something, but the driver did give me a stern, pants-shitting glare. Before driving off, he only said two things. I saw a climb up to your apartment. We'll be back for our money. Suffice it to say, I freaked the fuck out and told both my roommates. For the next 48 hours, we acted like morons, one of us staying up to watch in shifts at night for safety. Finally, the exterminator came back with a key to the attic. We were all very on edge, so it didn't help when the exterminator looked into the attic for not even a minute before climbing back down and telling us to leave immediately and to call the police. We did so, and only when the police came did the exterminator finally say what he'd seen. As you've probably guessed by now, the missing Russian had died in our attic, which was where the smell came from. Apparently, he had been living there for a while and using some makeshift tunnel in the spaces behind the walls to get in and out without us noticing. We never got the final word on how exactly he died, but I did learn it was slow and painful. The thing that still really fucks with me is why he never cried for help. He knew we were right there under him, but instead of seeking help, he just lay there, dying. Obviously, we had all had enough after that and moved out within the next week. Our landlord actually got arrested, but we never really found out what for. The day I was moving all my stuff out, I noticed the police had left the attic door unlocked, and I wanted to go up and see this place for myself during the day. It was very eerie. The space was tiny and cramped, barely enough room to walk crouched down. You could see the insulation on the walls. The bed was nothing more than a ratty sleeping bag, and the only source of light were a couple flashlights. Wrappers and empty cans of food were just littered everywhere, along with plastic drink bottles. A garbage bag was filled with some dirty clothes, and it looked like the cops had taken or confiscated anything else up there. The most fucked up thing, though, were the tiny little holes drilled in the floor. There were three spread out across the space. When I bent down to look, you could see our living room, kitchen, and bathroom pretty clearly. I don't know if the holes were just so he could make sure we were asleep, or if he was just actively watching us. Next to one hole was a clawed up section of floor with some blood, like he was just scratching with his fingernails nonstop. I feel terrified thinking that he was dying and couldn't speak for some reason, and maybe his scratching was a call for help. I'll never know, but it had really fucked me up to this day. I, uh, I might have something fresh for my girlfriend, unless she's making shit up. Bianon's girlfriend, yes, female, 
live in Central Europe, a small town next to a larger city, not far away from a local highway. Get a lift to your place from Anon by car. Say see ya to each other. Girlfriend stumbles upon family members that were coming back from a party. Everyone is home. People are going to bed. Girlfriend decided to stay up late and watch some scary shorts on TikTok. Yeah, I know. Suddenly, she hears some weird noises around dumpster. It's encapsulated, so the thing in question had to get inside, somehow. And it stays closed because of wild hogs and foxes mainly. She described those sounds as screeching sounds of a big bird, but somewhat high-pitched. Nothing like a wild hog, which is really common here, or cats fighting or meowing. It even activated a movement detector. Light bulb turns on if someone or something is close and big enough, so it had to be inside of the dumpster. It lasted for around 30 seconds with pauses. Girlfriend could hear how it was walking, but that walk was more like a rustling. After it stopped, everything went really silent. Bros, what the fuck? Is some fucking skinwalker stalking my girl? Do I need to call Fox? Growing up in shitty town in the vicinity of Memphis, probably 15 when this happens, hanging out with a greasy metalhead friend of mine and smoking a few blunts. He lives in a much more urban area than I do. I live in the suburbs. It's getting late and I need to head home. He says he'll walk with me because it's a bad neighborhood and he's tall and wide enough to probably scare off any friend that pulls a knife on us. Stop for a second because friend needs to call his mom and tell her where he's at. Windowless van pulls up by us. By windowless, I mean it was supposed to have glass in the windows, but the panes had been removed. Can't really see inside. Smells faintly of piss and cigarettes. Anorexic looking chick leans out of a front seat window. Hey! Can tell she's on something. Her eyes are looking in two different directions, and she's covered in sores. Wanna party? N no thanks, bro. I I'm good. She stops for a second, going from smiling to scowling at me and panting like a dog. Gruff voice from the van tells her, Jesse, get back here, you fucking bitch. She whimpers, then leans back in, and I think goes into the back. Notice that whoever is in the front seat is staring at us can just barely see the streetlights glinting off of his eyes, like with cat eyes. Can see from his silhouette that he has to be fucking jacked. Immediately become aware of just how easy it would be for this guy to subdue my friend and grab me, grab friend's arm and start walking. Van stays there, look back and I swear to God, the guy is still looking at me. We go through some alleys to get away, almost home now. We were power walking the entire time and I needed to stop because being out of shape and mildly stoned was making it hell to breathe. Sit on the curb, on the outskirts of the urban area now. Notice, like probably a block down, that same van is now parked by the curb. Watch this young looking girl, couldn't have been older than 13, get into the back. I swear to God, I could feel the fucking driver stare at me as the van peeled off. That face went, next day, there's a few missing persons case on the news. That face one, one of them is the anorexic chick I saw, and one of them looks like the 13 year old girl that I saw. That face one, I could have been one of them. And you didn't fucking call anyone? Here's a story about my attempt to photograph a crawler. Be me, live in a small town in the northern part of the US. Around December of 2022, there had been crawler sightings in my town. It got to the point where some people were seeing two to three at a time, every few nights. Don't believe the sightings at first, until one night, I'm driving back from my shitty wagey job. Spot one walking along the road into the forest. It walked like both feet were nailed to a plank of wood. It was also gaunt with long spindly limbs. The thing was naked and had white slash gray skin. Didn't get a good look at its face. I doubt it was a homeless person or a drug addict due to how cold it was that night. Anon doesn't know what a homeless person is. Decided to try and get a photo, come onto X, and ask for tips on cryptid photography. Get some good pointers about getting good camouflage and equipment. Best tip was to ask local hunters for advice. There are a few people who hunt for fun in my town, but most of them go to hunting preserves outside of the town. There are two dudes who do know how to hunt and have a good understanding of the area. I'll call them Martin and Jake. Martin is 30-ish, kinda shifty and quiet. 
He's moved to the area back in 2016, after getting in trouble with some of the law enforcement down south. He now spends most of his days walking aimlessly around a town when he's not drunk in his RV. Jake is 63 years old and has lived in the town since before most of the roads were properly paved. His father used to take him hunting in the woods when he was a child. Both men know a lot about the area and agreed to help me get a few photos. They tell me they want to wait for the storms to subside and for the snow to melt a little. Decide that February 28th would be a nice date to shoot for. Agree. And during this time, they teach me useful stuff like how to avoid detection by fox walking and making camo out of dead foliage. Slowly, sightings of the crawlers dwindle, and by late January, there was only a few sightings every two weeks. Weather was also pretty bad, so we moved the trip to the 1st of March. Day of the trip comes around. We head into the woods. Jake has his father's old Garin. Oh, here we go. Martin has an old beat-up Winchester shotgun. We hike into woods and for the first few hours, swapping stories and chatting about life. Nothing too bad happened that first night. In the morning, we stumble across something odd. It was a wolf, or what was left of it. It stunk to high heaven, and its head and stomach were the only parts left. The rest of the day, we are more alert. No more fun stories after that. Martin wants to head back. It was still pretty cold too, and the previous night had been pretty bad. We decide to cut the trip short by two days, and just spend one more day out. Jake says we should head to one of the creeks, where a few animals usually congregate around. While we're walking to the creek, the smell returns, and it is downright nauseating. Martin starts getting vocal about wanting to head back. Jake also is starting to show concern. At this point, I felt maybe dicking around in crawler territory in wintertime wasn't the best of ideas. We decide that maybe it would just be best to head back to town and come back in the summer. On the way back, Jake says he knows a shortcut to where the van is. He says that there is this old stone path that leads us to the van. We follow, but something starts to feel off. My vision seems to feel off. The best way I can describe it is when an old camera struggles to catch up with rapid movement and everything is glitched. Martin starts saying something about his feet burning and Jake is basically dead quiet the whole time. Sun is starting to head down and we are nowhere near the van. Ask Jake if we can sit down and tell him how my vision seems fucked. Jake doesn't respond. He just keeps walking forward. I ask if he's all right. No response. Martin asks Jake if something is wrong. No response. My head feels like it is on fire at this point, and I just sit because I just want the pain to stop. Martin starts yelling at Jake, but Jake just keeps moving forward. Finally, Martin shoves Jake to the ground. Jake asks what happened. He says he doesn't know what's going on. My headache was starting to subside a little, but the sun was finally dipping down below the horizon. Jake asks where we are. Martin asks Jake what he remembers. He says he remembered us heading to the creek, and then everything after was a blank. We don't know what to do, and we start to panic. The sun goes down, and it's pitch black. This was the first time I realized how dark the night is without any streetlights or cars. It was like staring at a wall. Could only see like three feet in front of me. It was also so cold that it felt like needles were being shoved into my face. Fumble through my bag and pull out a flashlight. While searching for a flashlight, I hear Martin trying his best to bring Jake up to speed. Find it. And before I can say anything, Martin goes quiet. Jake goes quiet too. For 10 seconds, it is completely quiet. No animals. No wind. Not even the sound of snow being crunched by footsteps. The smell hits my nose, and it completely overtakes my nose. Start to cough, then look at Jake and Martin. They are pointing at something. Look to where they're pointing, and see something white pass, cut through a tree. Martin screams, and points his Winchester at something. Jake starts to back away from Martin, and towards me. Point the flashlight in the general direction of where Martin is pointing his gun. It's a crawler. Martin tries to fire his gun, but nothing happens. He tries again, and this time, something does happen. The fucking gun explodes. Birdshot flies everywhere, and Martin falls to the ground. Ears are ringing. Everyone is screaming. Catch a glimpse at the thing. It's taller than any man I've ever seen. Skin is gaunt and colorless. 
Limbs are spindly, way too weak to support this thing. Face is almost featureless, almost. I say almost because the eyes are the main feature, black, like a shark or a dog's eyes. Stare into them and I am met with the worst feelings. It was like my mind went blank and every thought was instantly replaced with pure negative energy. It was like staring into eternity. It was one of the worst feelings and I am struggling to put it into words of what it was like. Loud bang fills the air. Jake has started firing the rifle and tells me to drag Martin. Martin is on the ground, writhing in agony, cursing and screaming about everything and everyone. Birdshot and bits of metal are embedded in his face, hands, and arms. Help him get onto his feet as I hear a ping. The thing is gone now, and it's just us. The wind starts picking up again. We drag Martin for about 40 minutes, trying to reach a road. We are lucky enough to stumble upon a road, and a car picks us up. Martin had to get a few bandages and stitches. It's been a few days since the incident, and Martin got discharged from the hospital a few days ago. Paid for his hospital bills and tried to talk to him. We talked for only a few minutes about what we saw. The last thing he had told me was that he was taking his RV and heading to the southwest. He left two days ago. Jake, on the other hand, plans on seeing his family in Florida in a few days. He gets uncomfortable every time I ask about what happened that night. And that's the story of how I saw a crawler and vowed to never go looking for cryptids. This shit's gonna be a short green text. It's been years since this happened. Ten at the time. At home with grandma and cousin. Shit house without Wi-Fi. Hungry as fuck. Thought about heating up some food. Got some rice and sausages. Put food in microwave. Suddenly. See a reflection of kid in white clothes. Kid moves very fast. Thought nothing of it. Finish eating. Doing dishes. Grandma comes in the kitchen. I asked why cousin's running around. She said he wasn't. And that he's been sleeping. Ask for wet clothes. Grandma said that he was wearing red clothes at the time. Got spook and went back to my room. Later on, Grandma explained in the house that there's some unnatural shit that happened. Forgot what she said though. It's been eight years. So here's a few brief spooks that... I think are connected. Starting from where it began. Be me, nude and in bed, burning up cause there's no AC, and the ceiling fan annoyed. Why I'm naked to begin with. Can't sleep, so I try to entertain myself, to lull my overly active mind to the dreamland. Been reading X a lot, so naturally my mind gravitated to the supernatural, and succubi in particular. Dream up a scenario of meeting one, as I soak my sheets in sweat. After a few minutes of polluting my mind with lewd daydreams, hear, clear as day, a husky feminine sigh and feel warm breath on my ear. Bolt upright, heart pounding, turn on light, search room, get dressed, and lie awake in a panicked state for hours. Fall asleep, eventually chalk it up to an overactive imagination. It happens again the next night, but this time, I feel a hand brush up against my cheek and wait on the other side of the bed. Lay still, scared shitless. Don't sleep that night. Burn incense. Don't sleep nude. Occupy mind with readings of old horror stories instead of fantasy. Nothing happens for a few months. Until, a few days ago, when I was struggling to sleep and put on some podcast about Bigfoot to drift off to sleep to. Except, as I finally got comfortable, I heard and felt a sigh in my ear. Much harsher and more irritated sounding. Eyes shoot open, spot a snow white face with black hair, and big staring eyes looking at me from the edge of my bed, leaning from behind the bookcase I use as a backboard and wall. Nearly spit out my heart, I'm so frightened. Nothing's happened since then, but I can feel a presence whenever I'm near my room or I'm in it in the dark. Not even the first time I've seen shit in this house, but it's the first time I've heard and been touched by one of these things. Mediterranean spooks. Creepy stuff from Mediterranean countries. I'll share what I have. Can keep them coming if you're interested. Be some random farmer about 80 plus years ago. Summer night, outside with the cattle and a couple other farmers. Chilling and having something to eat. Smoking and talking about random stuff. Hear faint sounds in the distance. 
think nothing of it. Sounds increasing in volume, and can be distinguished now. Faint voices and whispers. Put out the fire because we don't want any issues. Partner grabs his hunting rifle. Sees something red glowing in the woods. Looks like a big group of people in a straight line. Rifle partner drops the weapon and tells us to hide. It's dangerous to be outside because of civil war, so we don't argue with him and move to a dip next to the dirt road that goes through the forest. Voices get closer, but can't distinguish what they're saying. There's silence all of a sudden. We're holding our breath, crouching. Rifle guy is praying in silence. I move a bit so that I can get a clear view of the road. See group of people. I call them people, but they're not people. More like faint shadows. The kind of thing you're not able to see if you're looking directly at it and have to use the corner of your eye. Red lights we saw before are candle lights. Go back to the group in the eerie silence. Rifle guy has his eyes closed. Other dude is confused, but terrified. Start hearing same voices as before, but it's coming from a different part of the forest. Rifle guy loses it and starts sobbing. Can hear sounds again, everything going back to normal. Rifle guy tells us to wait for a bit. After a few minutes, he stands up, grabs rifle, and starts heading back to the village. Refuses to tell us anything about that night. Other guy tells me he thinks he knows what it was, but isn't sure. And because of the nature of what it could be, he prefers not to say anything. Rifle guy falls ill a couple days after that night. Ends up dying in a week. This past Christmas, I was chatting with a former commando online. He told me he had several spooky encounters in the woods, and I asked him to type them up for me with as much detail as possible. I know X hates in a wood stories and longer stories these days, but I enjoyed reading them. I will share them here in the hopes that others will enjoy them as well. Here goes. I'm a military vet, not in the United States. I've seen combat, trained information gatherer and scout. During summer 2016, I began making semi-regular patrols around my property to catch as many tweakers as I could after I had caught them using my property as a shortcut between labs and crack houses on the road. I captured a few war trophies, like wallets, phones, or hats, but one especially hot day. I was exploring an area I had not visited before. While there, I found an absolutely enormous old growth softwood tree. The thing was massive, easily 15 feet around at the base. It had good coverage if I wore good camouflage and offered a good view of a highway that the tweakers used. One especially hot afternoon, I was patrolling when I sat down at the base of the tree and rested a moment. I leaned back, drank from my canteen, and closed my eyes for a bit. When I did that, the wind picked up and I began to shiver from the unseasonable cold. I opened my eyes, turned to my right, and saw it. There was a human silhouette about 30 feet in the air. It was totally transparent, about the size of an average adult man and hovered perfectly still in midair, in front of the alder trees behind it. It was clear enough that I could see the trees behind it perfectly. All that was there was the outline of a man, without legs. It just trailed off into nothingness. It was like reality was embossed around the shape of this thing, and I could feel it was just staring at me. A slow, creeping horror came over me as I stared at it. I blinked, and it stayed in place. I blinked again and it still didn't disappear. I felt paralyzed with uncertainty and fear. It was clear that I was in this thing's home, and I was not welcome. I sat up, and slowly, I looped the shoulder strap of my backpack over my arm, grabbed my rifle with my other hand, and in an instant, I was on my feet, turned away, and running the opposite direction, while the wind kicked up again. Even in direct 98 degree sunlight, I still felt as cold as in winter. Trees shook, leaves fell around me while I sprinted through the swamp, back to familiar territory, until I realized I was totally lost. I ran in the direction I'd come from, from familiar territory, but I was nowhere that I'd been before, in a clearing in the swamp. I took cover behind a fallen tree, and began appraising the situation. I was still alive, and far as I could tell, I was still thinking rationally. I knew the direction I came from, and relative to that, I had a rough idea of where the road was. The creek was still present, and if I followed it far enough, I would eventually find where I came from. Slowly, I began exploring the clearing and found a small trail behind another old cedar. Where I was, 
the tree was blocking the exit from view perfectly. I still felt like I was being watched and I wasn't welcome, but I followed the trail and after about a quarter mile, I was only about a hundred yards from familiar grounds when I began running. I finally found my way back to my property. It took me a long, long time to return to that area. I'm man enough to admit that I was terrified of what I'd seen. Eventually, I got balls enough to return with a better plan, and soon after arriving, the wind kicked up again, just as violent as last time. This time, I began to pray, and using advice from dumbass wannabe pagans that I used to know, I audibly spoke into the woods that I had no idea what that thing I saw was, and that I have no quarrel with it, but it does not have my permission to follow me home, nor do I allow it to follow anybody that I know or care about. I returned to that area multiple times afterwards, and never had any other such experiences, but I made damn sure to always say aloud that it didn't have those permissions. At this point, I asked the commando if the wannabe pagans ever told him what they thought that thing was. He said the following, Forest White is what they called it, like a spirit that protects the forest in Euro myth, I guess. They suggested I leave an offering, something without any artificial, like plastic or rubber, type of components. So I left a wooden figurine and a bagel once. Didn't do shit. Now I found this guy's story's nice reads just before bed. So here's another. So, when I was in high school, my family managed a burger shack. It wasn't much more than a grill, two fryers, and a cash register and a horse trailer. But we had a good fan base in our town for our menu. And our town was a local schizoid that we'll call Roy. In my parents' generation, Roy was a big damn deal. He was the first to bring our high school football team to state. He was popular, he was handsome, and he had no shortage of girlfriends when he was young. But all of that changed after his brother died in a murder, disguised as a hunting accident, by another local schizoid. That drove Roy into a long, long, unbelievably dark, dark spiral that he never fully left again. He ended up diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia, and every few months, he would go off his meds. Then, he would begin attacking the asphalt road in front of his shack with a pickaxe. He said he was trying to dig down into the tunnel that the zippers used when they wanted to steal things from his home and escape undetected back into the woods. The zippers were so-called because of their speed. They would zip in and out again. Roy had been banned from every public space in that town for his panhandling and threats to people who questioned him. Roy claimed my family had a quote-unquote good aura we always treated him with respect, and my parents were friends of his before his episodes. Roy, upon request, could immediately recite all the numbers off the plate on every telephone pole in the town. He would often claim he was a reincarnated soldier from the Union Army named Robert G. Stebbin. S-T-E-B-B-E-N, he would say. Anyways, my family would often deliver fresh water to him in gallon jugs, and on one visit, he offered to show me the room where he spoke with Satan on a nightly basis. I politely declined. Roy had torn all the flooring from his two-room shack to burn for heat, and to expose the zipper's hidden tunnel network. This is where I ended up seeing what I saw. One day after work, I had a friend of mine tag along while making our weekly deliveries. Being off of his meds for so long made Roy a serious talker. He would jabber on for hours with his delusional ramblings never meaning to waste our time, though that's exactly what he did. So my friend and I sat politely listening to him, sort of. And after a while, I looked past Roy's shack, and I saw something in the woods behind it. What I saw was humanoid, standing about one and a half times as tall as a man, but about half as wide. It was covered in shaggy black hair. It looked back over its shoulder at us before bounding away into the brush, moving much, much, much faster than any person would be able to in such thick woods. I would have assumed it was just my eyes playing tricks on me as I listened to Roy's ramblings. The sun was going down, until my friend tugged on my sleeve and asked, Did, did you see that movement too? After a silent, intense car ride home, we finally talked about it. My friend only saw something move. I got the better look at it. We discussed what it logically could be till we decided it didn't fit any logical explanation that we could think of. So, we agreed just not to talk about it. Roy died a few years ago after letting some tweakers move in with him. Now his old hut has been demolished, and the road leading to it is blocked by several abandoned cars. 
and intentionally felled trees. At this point, after I incorrectly described it back to him, the commando specified. It was bipedal, roughly human proportions, just way tall, stretched out and covered in matted black hair. It looked over its shoulder as it ran off. Anyway, that's it. I'm off to work. Hopefully someone else enjoyed these. Here's one about my grandma's crazy, abusive stepmom. My grandma is a tiny four foot 10 woman. Nicest person I know. Compassionate, incredibly humble. Mom tells me it's because she grew up with a literal wicked stepmother. Described her as evil. Mom grew up around her too. I asked grandma about this one day. She tells me that her stepmother was very abusive. Apparently, grandma's dad traveled for work. He would be gone for weeks at a time. During that time, her stepmom would put grandma through hell. Grandma proceeds to tell me the following story. When she was still a little girl, her stepmom told her that she had a severed head hidden away somewhere. This severed head could talk, and it told stepmom secrets. Stepmom told grandma that if grandma ever lied or misbehaved, the head would rat her out. Naturally, grandma grew up nervous about doing anything bad. Stepmom would ask her to do the most insane shit, and grandma would just do it. No questions asked. One example she gave was that her stepmom asked her to walk 10 miles away to retrieve water from a creek in a little container. Stepmom laid down some rolls. Grandma wasn't allowed to set the container of water down anywhere, and she couldn't drink any of it. And she couldn't take any of her own water either. So basically, Grandma had to walk 10 miles in the blistering heat, then 10 miles straight back, all without any water and all without stopping to rest, or she would technically be setting the water down. And she had to do all of this for a little bit of water, even though they had a water well out behind her house. Stepmom would always be waiting by the well for Grandma to get home. Sometimes she beat her. Sometimes she didn't. Didn't matter how perfectly Grandma followed instructions. But she could always tell when a beating was coming because Stepmom would be pacing by the well, looking agitated. She would claim, The head told me what you did and beat the fuck out of my Grandma for no reason. As she got a little older, Grandma started developing a spine, asserting herself a bit more. Stepmom responded by telling her the story about how she got the severed head. Said it belonged to her ex-husband. Stepmom slit his throat one night while he was sleeping. To avoid suspicion from her neighbors, she slashed her own arms and legs, blamed her husband's death on a group of bandits, claiming they tortured them both. Stepmom showed Grandma the scars where she had cut herself said that if Grandma didn't act right, she would make another severed head out of her dad. And maybe one out of you. Grandma ran out of the house, crying. Stepmom laughing like a maniac as she ran off. Grandma ended up in the woods. She sat under a tree for a long time, crying, until she wore herself out and fell asleep. When she woke up, it was after dark. She had been there for hours. She got up and hurried home. She gets closer to the house, She's quiet so as not to wake stepmom. She's slowly approaching the water well behind the house when she hears two voices. Can't really hear them at first. Eases closer and can just make out stepmom standing by the water well. Sounds like she's talking to someone, but grandma doesn't see anyone there. There is definitely another voice though, which grandma doesn't recognize. But her first thought is, she's talking to the head. In grandma's mind, the head knows everything. And it's the main reason she's terrified of stepmom. So she panics at first, thinking the head knows that she's there, eavesdropping, and that it's going to tell her stepmom. But apparently, that doesn't happen. So, grandma keeps listening. Stepmom keeps talking. The other voice answers. Stepmom's just asking a bunch of weird questions that don't make much sense. The voice speaks really slow and has a deep voice. Grandma is suddenly curious about what it looks like. She tries to get closer but all she can see is the well and stepmom's silhouette in the dark. Then, the other voice says clearly, Someone is listening. Grandma freezes. Stepmom's silhouette ducks quickly down behind the well. It pops back up and looks around, then hurries away towards the house and disappears inside. Grandma stays perfectly still for a long time. 
She's worried that her stepmom might be secretly watching from the house. But she's also thinking that it looks like she put something down on the ground before she left. She thinks she left the head behind. After a long while of standing still, Grandma slowly begins approaching the well, crawling along the ground. She reaches the well, and her hands feel a strange patch of grass. She feels around. It's a pile of dead grass and leaves. It's covering something. Grandma feels around some more. There's a small handle underneath. She tugs at it. A door lifts up. It's a secret compartment in the soil. Down in the ground, about two feet deep, is a wooden box. Grandma thinks, this is what she keeps the head in. She's almost afraid to touch it, but she lifts it out of the ground. It's very heavy. Places it down on the ground next to her. She actually whispers, hello? Thinking it might answer, but nothing happens. She wants to look inside, but can't bring herself to do it. She decides she's going to get rid of this evil thing. Still worried that her stepmom might be watching, Grandma crawls on her hands, keeping to the shadows. She lugs the heavy box behind her as she goes, until she's a good distance from the house. She remembers a huge empty tree trunk that she passed in the woods earlier, and decides it's a good place to dump the thing. She hurries into the woods as fast as she can, carrying this heavy box, and dumps it into the hollow tree trunk. Then, she slowly makes her way back home. When she gets there, her stepmom is wide awake, sitting at the table. She asks Grandma where she's been. Grandma tells the truth. I fell asleep in the woods. Usually, stepmom either flies into a rage or threatens to ask the severed head if she's lying. But instead, she just orders Grandma to bed. The next night, Grandma sneaks out of the house, returns to the tree trunk where she stashed the box and retrieves it, sets it on fire, makes sure it's totally burned before she heads back. The next morning, her stepmother can't get out of bed. Grandma checks on her and finds her face looks warped, said it looked quote-unquote sideways, like her mouth was entirely on one side of her face. After that, stepmom was always very frail. The severe beatings pretty much stopped. Grandma was never sure if there was actually a head inside the box. She never found any bones when she burned it. But I know what I heard at the well, and she wasn't alone out there. A few years ago, working as a janitor in a small university, place is quite dead on Fridays, even the busier buildings. In one of these buildings, I always get the worst feeling when I'm working. Only really thought about it afterwards, after I found out what happened there. But I used to always feel very uncomfortable working there. In particular, there was one area that I used to clean, near the back of the building, where a stairwell led up to an upper floor. If you stood up on this upper floor, you could lean over the banister and look down onto the first floor, where I was working. This is the section of the building that I used to rush to clean. Again, I never really thought about it until later, but I hated cleaning there on Fridays because I was usually entirely alone, unless a random person walked by, and it always felt like I was being watched or something. Looking back, I used to constantly glance up at the second floor while I cleaned. Sometimes, I skipped that section of the building altogether. Later, I found out some kid had hung himself from the banister there. He did it late at night, and some student happened to come by and find the body swinging from the banister over the first floor. After I heard this, I thought about how unsettling the section of that building was, and how I used to constantly glance upwards, almost like I was afraid something would fall on me. Maybe not as spooky as some other stories, and it's probably easy to dismiss, but this was one of the few experiences I've had that really made me wonder if spirits were hanging around. Live in Chicago, have grandparents who live way out in the sticks in Tennessee, Visit them on and off throughout my childhood, but not close with them. Anywho, 12 years old, parents take me to visit grandparents like we do every couple of years. While there, I'm out with a cousin exploring the woods. Cousin ends up climbing a tree, and I'm walking around by myself when suddenly I need to pee. So, naturally, I whip out the little feller and urinate into the open air, spraying my piss as far as I can. Cousin suddenly starts yelling at me not to do that and scrambles down a tree, points to some pile of stones, which I had seen, but didn't think were important. Tells me it's bad luck to mess with them, 
and drags me back to grandparents. As we're heading back, I start to feel pretty ill. My cousins got me pretty scared and I begin to think, oh shit, I'm dying. Cousin tells grandpa what I did and looks really concerned, drags me over to a cow and forces me to pull some milk out of it into a pail. Meanwhile, I'm beginning to feel feverish and ask him if I can lay down. Parents are there now and mom is trying to pull me away, but grandpa holds her back. Dad doesn't interfere and she and dad begin to bicker Well, I think I'm going to puke. Then, Grandpa makes me carry the pail of milk all the way back to the woods. I'm pretty sure I'm going to pass out before we make it, but Grandpa keeps shoving me along and says he can't carry the pail for me, so I'll have to do it. My arms are getting weak. Palms are sweaty. Mom's spaghetti. But I manage to hold onto the pail till we get to the woods. Feeling woozy and things start to blur, but I hear Grandpa tell me to dump the milk on the stones and he shoves me forward. I pick that moment to puke everywhere. All over the stones, vomit on my sweater already, drop the milk, splashes over the stone, hear grandpa cursing and mom yelling, don't care, pass out. Wake up hours later, grandpa is there. Mom and dad still bickering, but mom looks relieved to see me wake up. She rushes to hug me, and grandpa pushes her back, leans in really close, and whispers, don't ever disrespect them like that again. Then, gives me a glass of milk and forces me to drink it down. Tastes like fucking shit. For years, I don't set foot in the woods. Nowadays, I camp regularly. I just watch where I fucking piss. My uncle smoked like a chimney all of his life. He lived with us for years before he died because his wife divorced him. Then, very soon afterwards, he suddenly lost his job and couldn't pay child support. Struggled for a long time. Once things started to get better for him, COVID hit and he lost his job again. Then he caught COVID and fucking died. Very sad time for me and my family. But the X part is that, per my uncle's wishes, dad had my uncle cremated, put the urn on a shelf in his study. A couple of days after we got the urn, dad and I both woke up to someone coughing. It was the same smoker's cough I used to hear from my uncle's room. Unmistakable. Only now, it was coming from the study. I could see it from my room, and I remember standing at my door for a bit, before my dad poked his head out of his room and looked too. His eyes were huge, and there were tears in them. The coughing stopped like two seconds later. We never heard it again. I think I've been possessed, or that I'm in the process of being possessed. Recently feel extremely low mood, lower than usual. Sometimes feel uncontrollable urge to move my arms and hands, or just flex my hands and arms really hard, like my body is full of tension. Keep talking to myself without realizing it. Often get lost in thought only for someone to snap me out of it and point out that I was mumbling. Ask someone once what I say when I'm having an episode. They say I just repeat the words, it's such a waste, it's such a waste. It is such a waste. Over and over again. Do things I don't remember doing. Neighbor said she was walking the dog the other day and saw me standing in the living room, looking out the window. Said that I wouldn't respond when she waved at me. I don't even remember being in my living room that day. Keep getting odd feelings of deja vu and having nightmares that I can't remember. Suddenly, feel very insecure about being seen. Wear a mask when I go out. Disposable from COVID era. Also wear my hood up at all times and keep my hands in my pocket. Suddenly, very conscious when people are looking at me, even my roommates, or when I go to see family. Also feel really tired and have to sit or lie down, often in the middle of the day. When I do this, my mind races like I'm seeing a rapid barrage of my past memories, and I start mumbling again. Every time I see myself in the mirror, I feel a strong sense of discomfort and look away. Wear my hood up in the house now, too, so that people don't see my face. What can I do? I've always been careful. I had multiple Hamza charms looking over my room, as well as a huge Hamza banner. I don't take risks when summoning. Is it possible for something to have latched onto me without me knowing? How do I get rid of it? I think serial killers are people with some messed up bits of code in their heads that are left over from our more predatory ancestors. I have personally had some experience with a serial killer in my hometown, 
if anyone is interested. It's not your typical X story, but it's still interesting enough. I was going up for a hike in these canyons, like I normally do a couple times a month. It's a great spot, and good for exercise. There's an old train bridge that goes across the ravine at some point. I say old, but it's been rebuilt recently. Anyhow, I decided to explore underneath the bridge and see what's down there. There's a lot of old abandoned rusty parts from construction, beer bottles, and a camping chair for some reason. I can hear what I'm pretty sure is people talking and walking up above. At some point, I hear what sounds like a cry for help, so I shout back and get a response. I run closer, but then there's a crash and a thud in the trees up ahead of me. I push through the bush as fast as I can, very slowly, and I find the body lying there. I'll spare you any gruesome details, but to say the least, the injuries were incompatible with life. I shout up for help, but they either don't answer or can't hear me. I freak out and try to call 911, but this place is pretty remote, and cell service is mostly non-existent. At this point, I'm not sure whether to move the body with me to the trail or leave it where it is. I decide it's probably a bad idea to mess with a potential crime scene, and plus, I don't want to get all bloody or carry a gross, disgusting, mangled corpse around. As I head back to the path, I can hear twigs and branches snapping in the distance. It's pretty much impossible to move in thick brush without making any noise. This person was trying, but without a whole lot of success. I immediately got a flash of, oh shit, when I realized that they might not have friendly intentions. It's hard to explain, but just the way they were moving... It sounded like they were trying to make as little noise as possible. So, why would someone be doing that? And right after someone calling for help fell off the bridge, and after I had been screaming for someone to help, fight or flight response kicked in. I sort of ignored my instinct and went for an intermediate option. I went a ways back into the brush and hid myself while still having a decent vantage point of the area that the body had fallen in. The noise coming through the brush got closer and closer. And after about five minutes, I could see someone walking down the slope towards the body. Their clothing wasn't remarkable. I honestly don't even remember what they were wearing. As for a description, I'm really not the best kind of person for that. I don't remember really specific details much like that. So all I can really say is the guy wasn't very tall, probably around 40-ish years old, and had some sort of hat on. Clothing was muted, no bright colors, but... It was still easy to see him. The guy walks up to the body and looks all around, probably looking for me. When he can't find anything, he goes back to the body and starts examining the wounds. The main thing I remember about his manner is that it was predatory. His walk, his posture, it all screamed to me that this man was a predator. The man pulled out a small folding spade out of his backpack and proceeded to drag the body further into the forest. I could tell he'd done this before just on the basis of how confident and assured he seemed to be. I waited for the noise to fade away, then got up and moved as quietly as I could back to the trail that leads back down to the park entrance where my car is. It took me about four hours to get here, so it's not exactly an easy hike back. After a certain point, I stopped trying to be quiet and just sort of half run slash jog the best that I can through the tangle of trees and brush, dead logs, and uneven terrain. It takes me a bit, but I get back to the trail, so I take a quick breather before heading back up the slope to the main trail. That's when I hear a sound. It's faint, barely noticeable, but I'm always paranoid for bears and cougars on hikes, so I have a pretty good ear for these things. I sort of realized all at once that this guy was a lot smarter than I had given him credit for, that he somehow knew I would be watching or saw me and pretended to walk off to bury the body to give me a false sense of security. My first instinct is to just dash off down the trail like a retard, running and screaming for help. I came so close to doing that. If I had, I honestly think I wouldn't be here today to tell the story. The whole thing is a bit of a blur in my mind, but I recall thinking about how he had outsmarted me and basically tricked me into thinking he hadn't seen me while he followed me covertly. Thinking about it, I wondered just how long he'd known I was there. He probably had seen slash heard me from the top of the bridge, maybe watched me for a while when he came down. It's hard to say because 
This is all stuff I'm thinking of in retrospect, but it was clear in the moment that he had outsmarted me because I had underestimated him and that he was much more dangerous than I had first anticipated. He was moving with uncanny silence now. If I hadn't been aware of him, I wouldn't have heard him at all. I actually hadn't heard him at all for a few minutes, and I was scared that he was way too close for comfort at this point. So, rationally, assuming that he couldn't catch slash kill me if I ran away was dumb. The smartest way to play it would be to pretend I didn't know he was following me. So, I made a show of being upset and scared and trying to make a call on my phone. Of course, there was no service before going back up the trail. As the trail reaches the top of the canyon, it continues along in various straight stretches for quite a ways. Basically, it's hard for someone to sneak up on you because it's a big, long, straight gravel trail and more of a gravel road than anything else. I actually see 4x4 vehicles driving on it every now and then. I have a really good feeling that he's behind me, but I'm too afraid to turn and look because then I think he'll know that I know he's following me. But at the same time, maybe not looking is suspicious. But I pretty much decide to just keep walking ahead. Hurried pace, but not too fast, even though my heart is pounding like a jackhammer. After a while of walking, I take out my phone and pretend to try and make another call on it. But I actually take a quick sneak at the reverse camera selfie thing on the camera app, and I'm able to confirm that he is, in fact, on the trail, following behind me. I'm a few minutes away from full-blown panic, and still trying to stay as normal as possible, while this killer is stalking behind me. Does he have a gun? If he has a gun, he could be shooting me at any moment. It could just be lights out. My life shut off without me even having the courtesy of hearing the bullet before it disconnects my brain. Should I just charge him? Try to ambush and surprise him? Is he waiting for something? When is he going to make his move? What the fuck should I be doing? That's pretty much the shit that was going through my head. I had no idea what I was going to do. Then I had the thought that he knew that I knew he was following me. What if I'd underestimated him again? What was he planning? I'm not sure if it was adrenaline or fear that caused a response, but something just sort of clicked inside me. I realized that this guy was a predator and that he was familiar with the chase. He delighted in the fear of his victims. He could probably read the fact that I knew he was following based on my body language. He could probably tell I was terrified out of my mind and he was probably getting off on it. So I did the one thing he would never have expected. I stopped, turned around, and started walking towards him. I don't know where I got the confidence from, but it came out of nowhere. All of a sudden, I wasn't scared. I was angry. I was furious. I was the opposite of scared. He was obviously a bit confused as he stopped walking to stare as I came toward him. As I came further, I pulled the six-inch buck knife I keep on me for bears out, tossed it off to the side like it was worthless as I kept walking toward him. I'm not sure why I did that, even now. I was basically acting on pure primal instinct at that point. The memories I have of it are almost in third person, like I'm watching someone else. In any case, whatever the reason, I tossed my knife away screamed at the top of my lungs while pounding my chest and charged him at full speed. I was around 20 feet from him when he pulled what I think was a gun out of his waistband. I'm honestly not sure because I never got a good look at it. If it was a gun, maybe the safety was on, or it jammed, or it was a fake. God knows. All I remember from that point is slamming into him, wrapping my arms around him in a bear hug. I had about 4 or 5 inches on him height-wise, and probably around 50 pounds in weight. I don't remember how long the struggle lasted, but it ended when I chucked him off the side of the path into the ravine, which was, at this point of the trail, an extremely steep slope that was basically 800 feet, nearly straight down to the riverbed. You've probably heard of the adrenaline giving you a shit ton of strength thing, and I'm absolutely certain it's true, because I literally picked him over my shoulder and tossed him a good 10 feet straight out from the path before he began to fall. I saw the whole thing in slow motion as I did it. The panic and fear in his eyes. The struggle. The panic. The flailing as he began to fall. Weirdly enough, I had a boner afterwards. Are stress rage boners a thing? Who fucking knows? Anyway, I took a while to collect myself, and then I just kept walking back to my car. And yes, I still hike there to this day. Because fuck letting that dickhead 
take my favorite hiking spot for me. So I know this one probably isn't all that spooky, and I could tell the paranormal bits in just a few lines, but maybe you'll bear with me. This is an event that meant a lot to me, and I want to share it. Grow up in a small house in the suburbs. It's me, my baby sister Katie, and my parents. I love spending time with my baby sister. She's four years younger than me, and basically a little sponge. So I spend a lot of time teaching her about all of the shit that I think is cool. She thinks I'm a superhero, basically. Happy family photo dot PNG. When I'm 12, Katie dies. I don't want to go into too much detail here because it's a bad memory, but basically, it was a hit and run on our street. I take it badly. My school grades plummet. My interest in hanging out with friends goes out the window. I just can't fathom it. Why would God allow that to happen to a sweet little girl like Katie? Why would he allow it to happen to me? My faith in God dries up. By the time I was 16, I was a certified fedora-wearing atheist. Even bought a Richard Dawkins poster for my room. I know. Cringe. Fast forward. I'm 20 years old. Drop out of college and move out of my parents' house. Get a job at a restaurant where I make decent tips and can afford to live alone in the city. Doing pretty good, but the bitterness never leaves me. Every year... On the anniversary of her death, her smiling face pops into my head. By that point, I had stopped visiting her grave. It was just too hard. But I always spent the day thinking about her. She was a brave kid, full of energy. My parents were happy to have me around to help look after her. She was a real handful. It was my job to keep her safe. It's my fault she died. Every year, I relived that same feeling. Feel free to ignore. I just need to get this out of me. Fast forward a couple of years. I'm a trainer at the restaurant where I work. I get tasked with training a new guy named Walt. He's a young black kid from Mississippi. Real thin, small, and soft-spoken. I think he's too shy to be a server here, but I train him as best as I can. But his first night was a total disaster. And after one weekend, management canned him. After I get off of work, I find him just sitting in his car, crying. Long story short, I invite him out for a burger, and we get to talking. He tells me all about his situation, how he's been living with his alcoholic mother and her dickhead boyfriend, how her boyfriend convinced his mom to kick Walt out, how he's been bouncing from job to job for about a year, struggling to get by, eating maybe once a day at most. Shit, I could go on, but the point is that his story really tugs at my conscience. I don't feel right just going back to my own bullshit little life after that. I invite him to crash at my place until he gets on his feet. And after a lot of hesitation, he finally agrees. Fast forward again. It's about three months later, and Walt and I are best buds. We both like movies and good food. I discovered that Walt was a great cook. He even used to set up all of his ingredients in little bowls on a kitchen counter. Misa in place, or whatever. He would arrange the bowls in a circle for good luck, he would say. I convinced him to find a kitchen job, and he did. He's been working at a nearby barbecue place for a while, and is saving every cent trying to find a place of his own. He finally finds something. I go with him to check it out. It's affordable, but kind of a lousy little place in a sketchy neighborhood. But I've learned that Walt's a proud guy, and to him, it's better than leeching off of me. He's set to move in next month. One night, before his move, we're casually watching some movie that's on TV and shooting the shit. Walt brings up how, when he was a kid, he had an older brother who was murdered. This was back in Jackson, Mississippi, which he said was really segregated and still pretty racist. His brother was attacked one night by some white dudes, and they killed him. His mom never got over it and started drinking heavily. Everything fell apart from there. Walt was just 10 years old when this happened. He felt like he always had to look out for himself from then on out. His mom treated him like shit. Her boyfriends all treated him like shit. The other kids in his neighborhood weren't any better. They called him a pussy and a friend because he was smaller than everyone else. He used to get pummeled a lot. He pauses as he's telling me this, getting choked up. This is the first time in his life that he's felt like anyone gave a shit about him, he tells me. And he wants to thank me for everything. I tell him it's no big deal, and that it felt good to be able to help him. That night, I'm lying in bed, 
and it hits me. Walt's childhood and mine are total opposites. Walt felt like it was him against the world, that nobody would ever be there for him. I always felt like I let everyone down, that my job was to protect my sister, and I failed. I think about this as I go to sleep. The next day, Walt moves out. Just a couple of months later, Walt's life is looking up. He's managed to fix up his piece of shit car. He's dating some cute waitress who works over at the barbecue place. And his skills in the kitchen have not gone unnoticed. Pretty soon, I'll be in charge of that thing, he told me with a big smile on his face. I congratulate him. He was standing in my doorway, looking happier than I'd ever seen him. That was the last time I saw him. I find out the next day that Walt was killed. Hit and run. The words fucking echo in my head. I'm devastated. I supported Walt as much as I could, but there is a little voice in my head that wants to say, it is all your fault. But it's not. There's nothing more I could have done. And I recognize for the first time, my sister's death wasn't my fault either. We were both just kids. I couldn't have known any better. I didn't see the car coming. I didn't think she would run into the street. I didn't know what would happen. Scenes of my little sister run through my mind. And this time, they don't hurt so bad. I said that was the last time I saw Walt, but that's not exactly true. Walt's funeral comes and goes. A pastor delivers a eulogy, and I think about God for the first time in a long while. It's not fair that life is so pointless, that Walt just has to rot in the dirt after suffering so much, that I have to lose the people that I care about. It's not fair. A week later, I have a dream. Walt's sitting under a large tree. I tell him I miss him, and he says, Why? I'm right here. The next morning, I decide to visit Walt's grave and talk to him for a little while. I leave some items that I think he would like, put them all in a little bag the size of your fist, and laid it right there on his grave. In the distance, I notice a large tree that looks like the one from my dream, and I walk over. Not sure what I was expecting. It's not like Walt's gonna pop in out of nowhere and say, hello. It's not like he can hear me, but still, I say, I miss you, man. Instantly, I feel a strange peace and a weird sensation. I can't explain it, just felt like a really intense form of goosebumps, only pleasant. I walk back towards the cemetery gates. The strange goosebumpy sensation hasn't gone away, and I look over at Walt's grave as I pass it. I stop. The bag of items is open, and everything's spread out over the grave. They're arranged in a circle. Maison plus. For good luck, I think. This is going to sound silly, but at that moment, a beam of sunlight suddenly streams down onto the grave. I remember Walt saying in my dream, I'm right here. And I can't explain it, but I can feel his presence. I'm kind of crying at this point. I tell Walt that I'm glad he's okay. I'm glad he's in a better place. I miss my friend. I miss my sister. But I'm starting to think there's more to life than we think. You can call it coincidence. You can say it's all in my mind. You can say that life is brief and when we die, we're gone forever. But I'm sorry. I just don't believe it.